a recording started here. Let me introduce our speaker, Derek Antonelli, retired U.S. Uh, Air Force officer, uh, is the president of the Calypso chapter of the Idaho Native Plant Society, and he serves there in the Coeur d'Alene area for that chapter. He leads the North Idaho Rare Plant Working Group for uh, IMPS. He's a charter member of the Ponderay Lake uh, of the Ponderay chapter of the Idaho Master Naturals Program, serving the Sandpoint area. And he is an amateur botanist with a great deal of knowledge. She's, he's been studying plants for 40 years now, and um, we really are grateful for the time and knowledge you uh, you generously donate to us today, Derek. So uh, with that introduction. Uh, I'll admit a few more people, and time is yours, Derek. All right, let me bring up my presentation here. Screen share. Here we go. Share. Hopefully, everybody can see my uh, slideshow now. Yes, I see it, Derek. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I guess I guess I don't really feel like a, a, a much of a great expert. I do have a, quite a bit of practice trying to trying to learn how the ferns go. So I'd kind of like to just talk to talk to you about that a little bit. Um, I've got my uh, presentation divided into two parts. The first part it will be talking about uh, general information about ferns. Uh, we'll go through uh, the, the fern life cycle and the fern anatomy, and then we'll take a, a break while I transition to a different set of slides, and then we'll go through examples of uh, different North Idaho ferns. I uh, don't have all the North Idaho ferns because there's way too many of them to include in a single presentation. First, a little bit about me. I, again, I've been working to learn plants for about 40 years now, now and uh, I'm still a work in progress. Uh, after I completed graduate school in 1979, I was uh, I was feeling pretty smug. I thought it would be pretty easy just to pick up uh, pick up a flora, flip through it, find what the name of the plant is, and move on to the next one. So I flipped open the book, and then it started talking about akines and filleries and this and that and the other thing, and I got completely lost. Was it wasn't able to figure out any of the plants. So I says, well, this. This, this is kind of embarrassing. And uh, so I decided to go on and uh, start learning plants uh, from that point on. And that, so I've been working on plants for that now that those 40 years. So again, I'm not a, a fern expert. Uh, I have learned some uh, as I've tried to learn ferns. And I just like to pass on a little bit of what I learned, kind of help you maybe get through some of the rough spots. If you would want to try to uh, figure out what ferns you're looking at. First, some general facts about ferns. Ferns are really, uh, really diverse group. Uh, there's about 11,000 species worldwide. We have uh, 60 in uh, 60 species in the state of Idaho. Ferns are vascular plants. That means they have uh, vascular tissues. You know, our vascular tissues are our veins and arteries. Well, plants have uh, xylem and phloem that that transports the the water and the nutrients throughout the plant. And that allows ferns to grow to very large size. Uh, and in fact, in the past, they used to be they used to grow to tree size. Uh, ferns are different from uh, many of the other plants, many of the more advanced plants, uh, in that they uh, produce via spores rather than seeds. And generally, all the all the vascular plants that um, don't produce seeds, they're all kind of lumped together, even though they're probably quite in very dissimilar groups. Ancient forests were dominated by ferns in the fern allies. Uh, they evolved a long, long, long time ago, about 360 million years ago. And if you think about that, that's probably 160 or 180 million years before the dinosaurs came on the scene. Uh, and uh, they're very, they're, they were responsible for forming the massive coal deposits that we have now, their forests grew up, and then, uh, then as as the as the the plants died, they they piled up and piled up and piled up, and that's where we get the, all the coal that we're using today. So. 
I mentioned that trees grow to a fern size. Uh, I'm not sure who this individual is, but uh, it is a nice example of how big the ferns can grow. You can see it's got a, it's got a regular tree trunk and huge, and huge leaves coming off of that. You can see the, the fiddlehead uh, forming here as the leaves uncurl. Uh, I actually saw some, uh, they weren't quite this big, but when I was at, going to school at the Florida Institute of Technology, they had a they had a a, a garden there, uh, and they had some of these. Uh, they were probably about this. They were probably about the size of the smaller one here. So, uh, very very impressive plant. Uh, so again, in the Carboniferous period, uh, there were there were actual forests of uh, club mosses, ferns. Uh, giant horse tails and you can see those you can see those here you know and they even had dragonflies that had two foot wingspans so uh, pretty interesting habitat back then but the uh, giant forests so and uh and they we would probably still have those today if, if the seeded plants hadn't uh, developed and taken over that role uh We've got the, uh, the typical uh, life cycle of a fern. It's it's kind of interesting. It's quite quite different from uh, 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 mammals. Uh, so we'll start we'll start on the life cycle. We'll start here with the spores. Uh, spores produced they, they fall out onto the ground uh, in a in a suitable location, generally a moist area, uh, and they will uh, split open and they will start growing uh, a prothallus. And this is this is what the prothallus ends up looking like. Uh, the funny thing about those is that they are uh, haploid. They only have half of the genetic component of uh, of, uh, of an adult fern, or maybe these are the adult ferns. I'm not real sure about how how to view this, since it's so different. But anyway, so so they'll grow up uh, uh, one of these prothallus, and on the prothallus you'll find it has some archegoniums where the eggs are produced in antheridiums where the sperm is produced. Now, uh, it's preferable for the sperm to swim uh, from one prothallus to a different prothallus so you can get a better mix on um, genetic material, but, but they can self-fertilize. Uh, uh, once, they, once they are fertilized, the egg, once the egg is fertilized, it starts, to, it starts to divide and produces an embryo. And now well, when they are fertilized, they become uh, diploid. Uh, they, have, they have the full genetic complement. And then the, uh, the embryo starts to grow right, on, right, right out of that archegonium on the prothallus. And uh, eventually it grows up into a, you get a, a sporophyte and the sporophyte grows up into what we recognize as uh, adult ferns. And it essentially obliterates the, the previous uh, gametophyte. So, uh, and then and then these go ahead and mature. Uh, they produce uh, sporangia in clusters that are called as called sorus. The clusters of sorus uh, that goes ahead and uh, produces the sporangia. Then produces more spores, and the cycle repeats. I don't know. Uh, maybe you can enter on the chat. Has anybody ever observed? One of these prothallus, they'd be really tiny things, but they'd be right down on the ground. So maybe you can indicate on the chat if you've actually seen that. So I don't think I've ever found it, but then I probably haven't spent enough time crawling around my hands and knees looking for them. So uh, this is an actual photograph of one. You can see the spore down here. It's split open, and then it grows into the uh, the young gametophyte of prothallus, and uh, that's. That's how that uh, part of the life cycle uh, proceeds. Okay, next we're going to switch over to fern anatomy. Uh, so ferns have uh, all, all the different parts. They have roots, stems, and leaves. Their stems are generally growing down under the ground uh, in what's called a rhizome. And then that rhizome will put out leaves every once in a while. So, and then the roots will grow off of the rhizome. So that's a uh, pretty, pretty standard, but, but again, you seldom see, you seldom see the actual stems. We did see it in the, the first photo of the 
actual fern trees, but uh, for most ferns that we, we, we encounter, you don't see that. Uh, and then the fern uh, uh, anatomy of the leaf, uh, you have the, the leaf also called a frond. It's got a blade portion and it's got the, a petiole portion, the leaf stalk. Now there's a lot of variety, a lot of variation on uh, how these leaves are, uh, whether they're divided or simple or, and, and so forth. So, uh, and that's uh, a lot of the anatomy that you'll have to learn if you want to try to identify uh, the different types of ferns. So the, the parts of that, uh, you have uh, again, uh, the midrib or the rachis of the, the fern leaf. And then it has, and then so you have the, this is the main leaf. And then you'll have some leaflets. Those are called pinna. Every, every, every group of plants has its own terminology, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to learn how to, how to use the keys is because you, you got to learn all the terminology first. So anyway, they have these pinna or, uh, or leaflets. And then sometimes those leaflets are subdivided into the sub leaflets. And sometimes those are subdivided into other leaflets and so on. So uh, this, this is called a pinna, the single leaflet. And then the pinnules are the sub leaflets. And, um, they, and it continues on like that. So, so here are uh, a set of, whoops. Here are a set of uh, the different types of uh, leaves. You can have a simple leaf. You can have a pentafed leaf. That's a leaf that is uh, divided, but not all the way divided. So that would be pentafed. It doesn't go all the way through to the rachis. Or it can be pinnate, which it does go all the way through. And of course, you've got the combinations where you've got a, a pinnate, pentafed, uh, leaf, or you've got a twice pinnate or a bipinnate leaf, or then you get a twice pinnate pentafed leaf. It gets more and more and more complex as you go, and so you just about get those under, understood, and then you get flip open to the key, and it's going to talk about a sub bipinnate leaf, and you pull all your hair out and start over from scratch. So that's kind of the point I usually get to. So. But uh, just to show you some different examples, this would be a simple leaf. Well, you, you can't hardly take a picture of a fern and not get another fern in. But anyway, we're looking at this fern now. You can see it's got a very simple, it's got a very simple leaf. No subdivisions on that. And we've got pentafed leaves. Uh, and here, so you notice that it doesn't go all the way through to the rachis, doesn't go all the way through to that midrib. So that would be a pentafed leaf. Uh, you've got a pinnate leaf. This one does go. Uh, it's got the single leaflet, but uh, it doesn't go all the way. It, and it goes all the way through to the all the way through to the midrib or to the rachis. So. And uh, you can have a combination. This one goes all the way through the rachis. Uh, these don't go all the way through. So this would be a bipinnate or uh, a two pinnate uh, pentafed leaf. So you've got a whole variety of leaves. And then of course you've got uh, fiddleheads, uh, which is uh, basically just uh, the curled up uh, portion before the leaf actually un uncurls, un unfurls. Uh, I know somebody's going to ask me, can, can you eat these? And uh, I, and uh, the answer I've got is I don't know. Uh, I do know that sometimes you can't eat them, but sometimes uh, even that same species may be toxic as it gets a little further on. So uh, my, in my advice would be not to eat them unless you really know what you're doing. So. Uh, another bit of uh, uh, fern leaf anatomy is sometimes you have dimorphic leaves. Uh, these are leaves where you have a sterile frond. That's the main purpose is to produce, uh, well, to do the photosynthesis for the plant. And you have a fertile leaf, a uh, different form of a leaf 
uh, that produces uh, the sp that holds the sporangia and produces the spores. So it's so you have fertile and sterile. I think I've got another example of those, and this is the deer fern. So. So this is one you're very likely to see if you're out, out in the talus, uh, grown among, you know, you'll, you'll find it grown among the rocks. Uh, it's the American rock break and it's got a dimorphic leaf. You can see the, the, the spore producing uh, fertile leaves and it's got uh, uh, vegetative leaves. So. And very common in North Idaho. Then you've got the reproductive anatomy. Uh, this is a cross section of a leaf right through uh, one of the um, sor right through a sorus. Uh, so you can see here's the cross section of the leaf, and you can see that indeed it is a vascular plant. You can see the vascular bundles here. So these are these are the veins of the plant. Uh, and then you cut through, and this is this is the the part where the the sporangia grow. So you got sporangia attached to the placenta there. And then uh, you have a protective covering, the indusium. So that's a, a little flap, uh, quite variable in different species, uh, very useful for helping identify uh, different types of ferns. This is uh, an expansion of the sporangium. Uh, sporangium is a little sac that contains the that that, that uh, contains the spores. It's got a a, a set of cells that are uh, thickened uh, considerably, and you've got some that are, that are thin-walled cells. And what happens is then, as as uh, the spores mature and uh, annulus, uh, the cells in the annulus start to dry out. Uh, they shrink in such a way that they pull. Uh, that sack open and the spores spill out. And, uh, you know, you think you can actually sit there and watch under the microscope and you just see it happening. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not like a, it pops open, and maybe some of them do, but the ones I've watched just kind of open slow and you can fall, see, the, see the spores dropping out. So. Then uh, here you can see this is a, this is a shot of main hair spleen wart. You can see the diff. Here's a, here's the indusium. That's the in this case it's a long flap that protects the sporangia. And then you can see the actual sporangia here. And you can see the annulus on that. See the annulus on those sporangia. In this case, this, uh, this is, uh, again, another shot of the maiden hair spleen wart. It's got the elongated indusium. Got other kinds of indusium. You've got, uh, in this case, this is, this is the maiden hair fern. You may have seen those around. Uh, the, the marginal leaf is folded over, and then the sporangia are located in, uh, under, inside that uh, the, the protected flap. So... Uh, this is these are these are moss capsules, and that's a whole nother discussion. So, uh, in this case, you don't really have a a, a discrete sori, a sorus, a sor, uh, discrete sori. Uh, you've got uh, the leaf uh, margin is curled under, and you've got you can see the sporangia. Uh, scattered all along under the, under the that margin of that leaf, and this is the bracken fern. So. Uh, this is uh, another fern that's got uh, uh, one of the dimorphic leaves, and so these leaves again, the leaf margins are curled under, uh, and sporangia are formed uh, inside uh, these. And then uh, this being the sword fern, uh, it's got uh, it's got these um, sori all lined up in a nice straight row, uh, except for this guy. I don't know what's wrong with him, but anyway, uh, these the, the enthusiasm on these is uh, called peltate, which means it's like a shield. It's attached in the middle and then spreads out over the top. It's attached in the middle, spreads out on the top, and you can see the the sporangia sticking out from underneath. Uh, that so, so it's kind of like a kind of like an umbrella or a shield. 
sometimes indusiums are uh, cup shaped, and this being the uh, fragile fern. Uh, you can see the little cup shaped indusium here. Uh, and a sporangia uh, sticking out on top of those, uh, or from the side of those. And then you've got other cases, in uh, this being uh, the wood fern, woodsia. Uh, you can see the uh, hair like segments that make up the indusium, uh, and they're actually underneath the sporangia. So I'm not sure what protection they've got, don't know why they're that way. But uh, that's kind of a different situation. And they're generally hard to find. But if you keep looking, you look at enough samples, you should be able to find those. Uh, another very common fern, the lady fern. Uh, find it in lots of wet spots. It has a horseshoe shaped uh, indusium. Or you can have uh, a sporangia without any indusium at all, this being the, the polypoid. Uh, fern. Or the oak fern, same, same way on the oak fern. A little different arrangement, but nonetheless, nonetheless uh, no indusium on those. That's all the uh, examples I have for um, uh, for the different anatomy of ferns. And next we'll be moving on to the examples of ferns that are found in North Idaho. And I kind of wanted to open up for questions right now. So let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Maybe I will. Eric? Yes. Um, I can read them off to you if you'd like. Well, let me, uh, I could probably figure out how to do it because I can close this one down. Let's see, I'll hit escape. I will. Chat there. I will reduce this. I will go back here. What's going on here? Oh, that's what's on my screen. I got it. So I should stop stop sharing for a moment. Okay, there. So if, uh, people have questions. I'd be glad to try to answer those now. They're in the chat. There's a few questions now. Okay. What is the anatomical name of the sub leaflet? Uh, you got me on that one. I am not sure. Sometimes they are called sub leaflets. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, 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 pinules. And I think you got pinules. And I think the same name pinule is used for probably however many uh, subdivisions it actually goes down. So your pinna is the, the main leaflet, uh, pinu pinules are for the, the, the subdivisions of that. Let's see. Lynn, show the fence is sensitive for, this is sensitive. Uh, let's see, okay. Whoop, whoop, whoop. How do I get to specific questions here? Okay, Lynn asks, you showed a photo of a sensitive fern. Is it sensitive like the sensitive plant, uh, which closes its leaves when touched? Uh, I don't think so, but I don't know that for a fact. I don't have much experience actually coming across those. Uh, what times of the year do spores produce, or do ferns produce spores? It kind of varies throughout any uh, throughout the growing season. Some some go early, some go late. Uh, when I was looking under the microscope, it might have been a, a, a dissecting scope, which would be around a, a, a twenty power, but it might also have been one maybe more uh, more compound scope might have been a, a forty power, probably the lowest power setting on a compound scope. Are native ferns deer resistant? Well, I don't know that. And what other, are there a few more questions here? That's all I see at this time. Uh, oh, there's one. All right. Well, I guess we can move on to the next uh, portion. Uh, again, if people have questions, just 
kind of filter those in and uh, hopefully uh, maybe maybe um, if you see a good question, Preston, maybe you can interrupt and uh, we can get those answered as we go. Okay, so back to share screen. Let's go close that. Share screen. Share, share. Uh, from the North Idaho. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to go through a, a number of uh, ferns and their allies that are they're found in northern Idaho. Uh, again, these are the spore-bearing vascular plants. Uh, they, they, the groups I'm going to be looking at are the, the ferns, horsetails, quill warts, uh, club mosses. Uh, the ferns, uh, they're, they're in a there are a vast number of different families and those number of those family, I mean, it used to be there were only a few families and now they, they keep getting subdivided, the families keep getting subdivided into new families and now there's all kinds of families and they're really pretty hard to keep track of. But uh, so there's a lots of different, lots of varieties in the ferns. So first family we'll be looking at is the adder's tongue family. Now I had talked to you before Talked to you before about uh, the dimorphic leaves, and this, uh, these actually have dimorphic leaflets. So this is a single leaf coming up, uh, coming up out of the ground, and then it's got uh, a, a, a sterile, a sterile portion, a sterile leaflet, which is very compound, and it's got a, a fertile segment. So this be this would be the leathery grape fern, and it's got those two portions. And you can tell this grape fern from the next grape fern the fact that this one has a petiole. You see that petiole right there? Um, no, okay, go away there. Uh, so, so, and then uh, of course the sporangia are produced up here. So, looking at the next grape fern, can't do that. Got to do it this way. There we go. This next one, this is the rattlesnake uh, fern, uh, another type of grape fern. Uh, but you can see here's 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 the main petiole, and it, and it doesn't have that sub petiole. The leaf, the the uh, sterile leaf, doesn't have that sub petiole. So that's how you tell those two apart. Uh, they're both fairly common. You'll see those from time to time. Uh, and uh, you can see then the, the, the fertile portions up here. Then uh, the, the moon warts, uh, lots, lots of different moon warts. Uh, most of them are actually rare plants. So uh, we have a lot of different ones in North Idaho, uh, this, being, this being one of them. Oops, of course it doesn't. So this is the scallop moon wart. Again, uh, two parts, two parts of the uh, one. So this is uh, one leaf, one leaf with two differential uh, leaflets. Uh, this being the, the rarest class of uh, rare plants in Idaho, uh, an S1. So S1, S2, and S3 are all considered rare. S4 uh, and 5 are, are more common plants. Uh, another leaf, uh, another uh, grape fern or moonwort is the uh, uh, lance leaf. Uh, you can see again the same the same arrangement of the, the dimorphic uh, leaflets. Uh, this is uh, one you're more likely to see. It's an S3. I have seen this around uh, several times. So. This is one that uh, Harpo found when she was doing her studies and she's the one who talked to you about uh, her study in the Selkirks. She just happened to find, when she was out, she was out on this road, this Bog Creek Road, uh, and she happened to find it in the actual road prism. Now, why it's found in the road prism is because this particular type of moon wart is adapted to moist gravelly soils, such as you find at the bottom of uh, avalanche chutes and such. Uh, and old gravel roads make a very good substitute for that. So this, this has been an unused road. 
Uh, Harpo found it's the first population found in the state. Uh, so therefore it is uh, that rarest category, the S1. Uh, one of the problems that we have right now is the fact that uh, the customs, the US Customs and the Border Protection wants to use this road to patrol the border. Um, therefore, they're wanting to upgrade the road. Well, if they upgrade the road without taking into consideration this particular population of moonwort, it will probably wipe out the entire population and we'll go back to having no known populations within the state. So uh, IMPS and I believe uh, Kinnikinick both have uh, uh, sent letters into uh, both, uh, both uh, the Border Patrol and uh, U.S. Forest Service, who are both, uh, you know, this is a Forest Service road, uh, and asking them to take into consideration these as they go on through construction. So it seems like they might be uh, receptive to that. So hopefully, we'll, hopefully things will be worked out. Eric, there's a question uh, specific to this about uh, if any mitigation um, is planned or proposed for this population. Uh, not, it, 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 uh, that's kind of what we're asked. That's what we're asking the Forest Service and the, the, the Border Patrol to do is to, to come up with some mitigation. So we're working with them on that. Hasn't, hasn't come to fruit yet. So. Uh, this one, the elusive deer fern. Now, uh, we went to uh, Deception Creek where we heard there was a population of this, uh, you know, uh, Calypso chapter took a, took a few, whoops, took a field trip to that. It's a rare plant, it's S3 in Idaho. Okay, I keep touching the wrong keys here. Uh, it's another one of those with the dimorphic leaves. You can see the, the, the vegetative leaf and the fertile uh, leaf. Uh, so we went to Deception Creek, which is in the Coeur d'Alene Mountains, looking for this. And we looked and we looked and we looked and we didn't find it. So uh, then we tried again when we were up for, uh, we had the, 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 the state uh, IMPS annual meeting in our area. So we went back looking for this again, still didn't find it. And I've been back yet again and didn't find it. So, uh, you know, obviously it's pretty elusive. And then I took a trip over to the Oregon coast and you can't walk down any trail there without finding it everywhere. So uh, apparently this is one of those uh, coastal disjuncts. It's uh, pretty rare in our area, but uh, exists in great numbers along the coast. Maidenhair uh, fern. I, I'm not sure if anybody, I've never seen this in uh, the northern two counties. I have seen this along, uh, I think along the, well, definitely along the Clearwater and I think maybe along the Coeur d'Alene. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has seen this. Maybe somebody can uh, chime in if they have seen this in North, uh, in uh, Bonner Boundary counties. But uh, this is, this is uh, actually one single leaf. So this is, uh, this is a leaflet or a penne, and this is a penne, and this is a penne, and this is a penne, and penne. So you have one leaf with four, well, with about six uh, leaflets, and then, and then sub-leaflets beyond that. Uh, Pinules all the way down that. So that one's a little different that way. Uh, this is the, um, in the marsh fern family, it's the northern beech fern. Uh, you can see it's very, got a very distinctive uh, angle on these lower uh, pinna. And uh, again, this is an Idaho rare plant, an S2. Uh, this is now uh, outside, well, this is a, a hairy water clover. It looks like a, it looks like a little four leaf clover. Oh, yeah. I, the first time I found it in North Idaho was up at the Boundary Creek uh, in the ponds there in the Boundary Creek uh, Wildlife Management Area. It's just the, the leaves were just floating on the top of the on the top of the water, out in pretty deep water. You know, it's probably about a foot and a half or something deep. And then I've also found it at the Albany uh, Albany Cove uh, habitat segment. Uh, which is just uh, below uh, the Albany Falls Dam. And, and these are the actual uh, specimens I collected there. Uh, 
Uh, so you can see it's got this, and it's got the spore producing uh, things. They're called the sporocarp, and they're down here at the base of that. So uh, and this was growing out on the mudflats that had uh, recently been exposed as the water drop, water level dropped. Uh, this one, uh, this is an Idaho rare plant, an S1. I just happened to be out uh, doing some work, and it was lunchtime, so I sat down uh, in uh, in a um, so kind of in the transition between a, uh, a cedar forest and the, and the more upland forests. And uh, there, was a, there was this fern sitting right next to me. In fact, in fact this, was, this is the one that was sitting right next to me. So I says, well, I wonder what this is. I picked that up and uh, took a specimen of that and, and then uh, went on, my, identified it, went on my way. And then some, some uh, well, probably a year later or something, I figured out that indeed it was a pretty rare plant. In fact, there's only uh, two populations that I know about uh, for this plant in Idaho. So, but it turns out there, I went back and surveyed again, and there were about 75 or something different uh, uh, individuals all along that area. Again, this is the one I had showed earlier that has that long flap-like uh, endusium. Uh, bracken fern, you know, probably, probably the most found in the most different types of uh, habitats. Uh, the most common one you'll probably see. Um, again, it, it grows in dry fields. It grows in forests. It grows uh, in open open woods. It grows lots of different places. You'll see this quite a bit. Uh, if you're in a, in a wetland area, you'll probably, uh, depending on the soil conditions, will find uh, lady fern. Very, very common wetland thing. Uh, you, you can see it's got, and, and you can tell it, it's got the compound leaves. It, it, they start narrow down here at the base and they get broader and they get narrower at the top. So they kind of taper at the bottom and taper at the top. Uh, they form, since the, the rhizome is growing uh, vertically, uh, all the leaves come off the same point and it gives it this funnel appearance. You can see the funnel appearance there. You can see it over here. So those are two things, and then if you're lucky enough to see the see the uh, sporangia or see the um, sori, sori on the, underneath, uh, you'll actually be you might be able to see the uh, the, the horseshoe shaped uh, indusium. But uh, one of the really common ones if you're in uh, in wet areas. Uh, if you're in uh, talus slopes, this is uh, you just about see this every time you get into a, any kind of talus area. Uh, this is American rock break. Uh, again, it's got the dimorphic leaves. You'll be able to see those. Uh, so you've got the, the fertile leaves, and you've got the you've got the fertile leaves, and you've got the sterile leaves. Uh, this is another one in that same habitat. You don't see it quite as often. Uh, and it's the, the brittle blat bladder fern. Um, so, and it's got that cupped indusium, which is kind of hard to see generally. But, uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at, if you got, if you got uh, sore eye underneath the leaf, if you, if you look close, you probably be able to find some of them with the cupped indusium. This is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, comes out uh, pretty early in the spring. Uh, it forms uh, very triangular leaves. You can see how triangular it's go here to here to here, very triangular leaf. Uh, again, very triangular leaf. Uh, you can see the type of habitat it grows in those moist forest floors. Uh, they could be fairly wet or they can, you know, just simply be moist. Uh, you can tell by looking at the uh, bunchberry uh, uh, dogwood that, that that's grown with or uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, false Solomon seal. So it grows in those types of environments. Uh, and, and again, sometimes it forms a big, big, big areas where they're all, they all come up all the same height, all the very triangular. So. Uh, pretty impressive displays at times. Uh, 
uh, sword fern. There's actually several different types of sword ferns, this being the most common of those. Again, uh, it's got the, the sori that are all lined up, uh, no endusium on those. Well, this, this says it's got a hairy endusium. So uh, anyway, not a very, not a very distinctive uh, endusium. Um, Again, moist forest floors or moist, uh, or moist slopes in the uh, fairly closed. Uh, I think it'd be fairly, fairly closed, fairly deep shade. Uh, the Western uh, uh Again, this is one that grows on uh, like rock, freight, rock faces, uh, areas like that, rock outcrops. Uh, it is a pretty, pretty distinctive, uh, uh, and it's got very round, very big, very large, very round, rusty colored, uh, enduzium, oh, it's not enduzium, but sorus, sori. And switching over to horsetails. This is the most common horsetail you're going to find. This is the field horsetail. It uh, grows out in lots of fields and wet areas and uh, all, you know, basically lots of, lots of different places. Uh, one of the key characteristics is the fact that it's got dimorphic stems. So you've got the, the, the fertile stem that comes up in early spring. And then you've got uh, the vegetative uh, stem that grows, uh, comes up and starts about early spring, but doesn't really branch out until later. And normally you don't see this and this at the same time. So normally this is already, this fades, you know, comes up, does its job, spreads its spores out, and then, and then uh, fades away and is gone before the, the main uh, uh, vegetative uh, stems come up. Uh, if you were to take and slice through uh, the stem, you'd find it had a fairly small central cavity. And that's one of the ways you can tell these horse tails apart is you can take a look at what that central cavity is like. So you can see it's got a very small central cavity. A water horse tail is uh, got a very large central cavity. Uh, grows uh, generally, the only time I've seen it's been growing out of uh, very, you know, growing right out of the water, you know, six inches, a foot of water. Uh, it might be temporary water, but usually when it's just getting started, it's covered in water. Uh, it's got, uh, it's got a blunt uh, and deciduous, so the, eventually the, the, the cone will end, end up falling off. Uh, but again, so very wet areas, nice, nice, nice straight tall ones. Then another horsetail is the marsh horsetail. It also grows in those wet, really wet areas. Uh, but again, this one has, uh, instead of being nice and straight, it kind of kind of has a, a crooked look to a lot of the, the stems and uh, the sub stems. Uh, and it's got a small central cavity. This one is, I think, the easiest one. You've got the main stem and then you've got uh, the side branches, and then those side branches have side branches, which makes this very distinctive. You can see all the branching that goes on on these. So when you're seeing that, you know you're looking at the, you know you're looking at the woodland horsetail. And not all the horsetails, not all the horsetails actually have those side branches. Uh, the next two we're going to look at don't. The scouring rush horsetail. Uh, it has a, 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 a long standing cone. It's going to stay on there a long time with a pointed tip. Uh, again, no side branching. Uh, although some of the other ones, that, and when they first come up, they don't have side branches either, but they eventually develop those. These do not. Uh, and you can see it's got two black bands. See a black band here at the base and a black band up here. Lots of times though, they get pretty pretty beat up and, and worn out because they stick on a long time and you might only be able to see the one band. But again, that pointed tip, uh, no, no, um, no stems. So. 
That's the scouring brush, and then the push it. Then the, the smooth horse tail. Uh, again, no 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 uh, side branches. Uh, a single dark band, and then a comb with a blunt tip. So this is not near as common as the other one. Uh, this one, the scouring rush horsetail. I don't know if you've ever been on the road up a highway 95 and noticed along the, 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 the railroad tracks there going to, oh, going past Elmira, just a big long strip, probably half mile or better, just solid of this stuff. So, so that, that's one of the places, but you see it all over. So. Okay, then uh, something else kind of kind of different is the the quill warts. It wasn't until just a few years ago that I actually uh, found one and figured out what it was. Uh, quill warts are little um, uh, well, little spore producing vascular plants. They they produce the spores down here at the base of the leaf. Uh, you find these growing in uh, shallow water. I found it in uh, the shallow water right at uh, where you come to the water at uh, uh, Jim Lake. So if you ever hike into Jim Lake, you'll, you'll be able to look out and see some of this growing there. But uh, that, that's a pretty common area for it to grow is in the, the waters along the lake shores. And there's several different species of this. And then the lycopods, the club mosses, and the spike uh, mosses. Uh, you've got the you've got the ground cedar. Uh, it grows in the, all, in the forest floors. It's kind of kind of got the, the 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 branches all laid out fairly flat. Uh, sometimes it'll have um, uh, the vegetated or the the fertile portions uh, coming up as well, but not always. You've got the bog club moss uh, again, fairly fairly low growing, uh, right right along uh, right along the, the 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 bottom of the the fen in this case. This is uh, Hager Lake. This is a, a floating uh, moss mat. Uh, this is actually probably where it's a moss mat. So this is full of sphagnum, but this this area right here, about 30 feet wide, is just full of uh, this uh, uh, bog uh, club moss. Uh, so it grows, uh, the vegetative branches grow uh, flat, and then every once in a while it'll put up a, a fertile uh, branch that stands upright. You can see the sundews that are growing in, in amongst it, so it's a pretty, a pretty unusual environment. Again, this is another uh, rare plant, uh, S2. Uh, another plant that uh, grows, uh, that I found at uh, Hager Lake, is the uh, tree club moss. Uh, this one grows uh, the rhizome, main rhizome grows uh, deep underground and then and then the uh, stem comes up and it's very forms a very tree-like uh, arrangement after that. Uh, one you're uh, a lot more likely to see, you, whoops, you find it growing along the trails and things uh, usually in pretty uh, pretty moist conifer forest floors uh, doesn't necessarily always have uh, the, the 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 fertile portions, but you'll find that these are actually pretty pretty tough stems that grow flat on the ground, and you'll just see it growing right up over or right up over stuff. Yeah, it grows pretty pretty nice along the ground. Uh, switching over to the spike mosses, uh, these grow on uh, rocks, uh, and when they get dried out, they look just like a dried out moss. In fact, um, you've probably seen it quite often and just never even re re realized it was a, uh, a vascular plant. You would probably would have just thought, thought it was a moss. And what do we got? So that's all I've got. So uh, I guess I'd be interested to find out uh, who is interested in going on uh, field trips and uh, any of the other activities. I'd like to do uh, a fern focus plant walk. I don't think we can probably have an entire, whoops, I don't think we can probably have an entire walk that's just looking at ferns, but uh, we will try to find an area that's got a number of ferns 
take a walk and notice the ferns as we go along and look at everything else that's growing there. So uh, I'd like to find out if it's uh, weekends or weekdays are better and see if you've got any good ideas for locations where you might have a walk that has pretty good uh, variety of ferns. And then also I'd like to have a fern identification session sometime. Maybe we could do that out at the uh, uh, Water Life Discovery Center. Uh, I don't know if we can do that this year with the COVID or not, but we can see. Um, but if there's any interest in that, uh, participants can bring in uh, uh, different samples of ferns that they'd like to identify. And then again, I'm not the expert, but I'd be willing to, to work with you and try to figure it out. So we'll pull out the keys and the books and the guides and see if we can figure out what it is we're looking at. And again, is weekend or weekday better for you? And I think uh, so. Eric, I'll, I'll launch those polls on those questions now. Okay. And then, uh, so I've got, uh, here's my here's my email address uh, that you can uh, uh, contact me at or my phone number. So, and then also uh, maybe if Knick and Nick has somebody I can work with, we can, we can uh, work out the details. Okay, people are voting now on what they'd like to do for a field trip. Okay. You give them a little bit of time to go on this. We have quite a few questions and comments in the chat when we can get through with the polls for you to answer, Derek. Okay. Um, all right. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I can figure out how to do that. Okay, I think we've got everybody who has voted on this. A few more voting. Well, it looks like we got uh, pretty good interest in it, and it looks like we got some uh, both weekdays and weekends. Uh, if we're, we're going to have uh, 20 to 30 people, I definitely want to split it into two groups. Uh, and so we can have one on a weekend and one on a weekday. And uh, just because, uh, you know, it's uh, plant hikes are probably good for up to about 10, 15 people. Beyond that, they just become too cumbersome. Uh, and then the people at the end uh, never, never find out what's going on at the front of the line sort of thing. So, Okay, let's see if I can get to the next poll question here. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, about a ID session. It was open for people to vote. Looks like people are really interested in these opportunities. That's great. Okay, sounds like there's quite a few people here. Maybe, maybe what I would do is rather than having a single, uh, a specific time when everybody meets at the same time, it might be that we go uh, that I could be out at the, the Water Life Discovery Center and. Uh, kind of be there for a, a period of time and people can come in uh, as, as they've got time and uh, we can go through and try, try to work on identifying uh, what they've got. So. Okay, that's great. Thank you everyone for um, your interest in, interest in this. Um, so the questions, if you get back to the chat again, Der Derek, the questions uh, start off again at the 10.32 a.m. mark. And then there's a whole bunch from there. <laughs> yeah, okay, close that. 1032, I don't know. I guess I'm not doing this right. Let's see if I can figure that out. Close that. So chat, see if I hit chat. No, oh, that opens it on the side. I don't see, oh, there we go, 1032. Yeah, it was Linda Wagner's question about okay. where, to buy, where to buy firms. 10, 10. 
Well, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay, there's 1029, 1032, Linda Wagner. I want to dig up uh, where you would buy f these ferns from. Um, yeah, I don't really know the answer. Probably the native plant, uh, uh, different, the, the same sources you go for native plant, you know, uh, like, uh, was it Cedar Mountain? Cedar Mountain perennials or? Um, yeah, Cedar Mountain perennials might might have some, uh, you know, Plants of the Wild might have some of that. I know I have seen a few. Um, I would think things like Lady Fern, I mean, I've had things that look awful lot like Lady Fern and maybe they are growing in the, my window wells and they just take over the whole thing. So um, that would probably be good good places to to go for that. Re related to that, Derek, how difficult are they to propagate? Probably varies a lot by the actual species. Uh, maiden hairs, you, you see those, oh, propagate. I imagine it uh, is probably it's probably pretty technical. I mean, you gotta gotta have the you gotta have the right medium to grow those to get them to to grow uh, on the soil. So you gotta know what that medium is uh, and get those to get those to grow and keep them at the right moisture. I mean, thinking about the life cycle, how how would how would you propagate those? You gotta get the spores to fall out in the right place with the right on the right surface and then uh be able to go but uh, you, you know if you can figure that stuff out i imagine you could you could uh, get some of these to propagate pretty easily so let's see oh uh well as far as mitigation goes on the the moonwort population on the Bog Creek Road, uh, we you know uh, they've already gone through the uh, oh, what is the document the uh, environmental assessment or uh, EIS anyway they've already got that all finalized so we're kind of coming to the party late so I would be happy if they just lifted up the blade instead of scraping the scraping the whole uh road out if they just went through and brushed that area out by hand uh would be what i would hope they would uh, be able to agree to and they should be able to do that so uh i thought it was fought with the litigation uh yeah there as far as as far as uh the road project being fought it is under litigation but that's all due to grizzly bear i think uh, and has nothing to do with the the, the, the moonwort, uh, but uh, so once once they get past that litigation, they're going to be able to proceed on the road, and hopefully we'll have a mitigation in place so they don't wipe out the population. Derek, there was another question that was directed just to me on on this uh, issue, and that is, are public comments being accepted? Uh, it's way past the the public. They've already issued their decision. So we're way past any public uh, comment, but uh, they, they seemed receptive when we sent them a letter. They they acknowledged receiving that and said they'd work with their counterparts. And we haven't gone to that next stage yet, but it's it's still pretty early. So uh, we will probably re-engage with them uh, when it comes time to identify. And we'd like to go back. We'd like to go back with another survey so we know exactly which areas need to be protected, whether there's any other populations of other uh, rare plants that need to be protected along that road. And uh, see if there's any other populations that are off the road, kind of reduce the, reduce the, the, the risk uh, of that uh, particular effort. So and that'll probably like to do that in late July. So, uh, let's see, do, uh, do sterile and fertile fronds develop emerge simultaneously? I, uh, yeah, this is where being a fern expert would help. I think uh, sometimes yes and sometimes no. So obviously uh, with the, like the, uh, with the field horsetail, where you've got uh, uh, fertile stems and uh, uh, vegetative stems, they come out completely different times. Uh, um, 
I don't know all the details on, I, I imagine you yeah, lots of times they'll have the vegetative stuff and then sometimes you'll get the fertile uh, stems coming up after that. It has not been stopped here. Okay, that's uh, more stuff on the, okay. Uh, oh, the maidenhair fern, somebody knows, Jane knows of it growing along the cedar drainages in uh, Garfield Bay. So there's a spot if somebody wants to go see that. Uh, I can inform SCA. Uh, uh, SEA. That's the Selkirk Conservation Alliance. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, can you transplant most ferns? Uh, I think you can transplant some ferns. Uh, these particular uh, moonworts, definitely not. They are uh, dependent upon uh, uh, fungus micro mycorrhiza that are growing in the soils as well. So if you move them somewhere else, they simply won't work. Um, okay, maiden hair also occurs along the upper uh, Priest River. Uh, yep, somebody else has seen those sword ferns. A uh, remedy for metal stings. Ah, oh, he's just smacking just plain old mud on there to pull that poison out. So. Uh, cool care things. Oh, got some good horsetails along the Ponderay Bay Trail. Um, okay. Time of the year do you see quill warts? I think those are. always there they're, they're they're under the water so uh i don't i don't know if they'll actually get frozen out or not but uh i think i think you find those I think you can find those throughout the year but i'm not sure they might be deciduous and just have to regrow every year uh carrie says amazing images uh, okay you're welcome and you're welcome and you're welcome and Fern walks. All right. Uh, so anybody else? Oh, uh, Moscow area. Yeah, I'd be I'd be willing to come down uh, and do a, do a combined hike down at uh, down in the Moscow area. Maybe Moscow Mountain or something. To, we can concentrate on uh, ferns and other things as well. Try. So if we can set that up, uh, just have somebody contact me, Nancy. And uh, all right, anything else? Am I missing any questions? About a good fern guide walk or fern ID book. Oh, um, <laughs> well, I, I always use the floor of uh, Pacific Northwest, but I know that's uh, uh, pretty detailed for a lot of people, but any of the, any of these guides, I've got uh, what the plants of uh, Rocky Mountains. Uh, you know, there's there's all all these plant guides. There there's there's lots of different ones. I think even uh, field guide to uh, forest plants of North Idaho. That free publication that uh, the Forest Service puts out has uh, some sections on ferns. So. Uh, you know, there's lots of different, there's lots of different sources. So, uh, any of those, but if you, if you definitely want to get all, get all of them, you'll want the flora, but that's, that's pretty complex. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lynn's got, uh, if anyone sees any species of the small moon warts. Again, yeah. So if you do see the small, the small moonworts, and they're uh, two, three inches high, usually. Uh, uh, so probably don't pick those unless there's lots and lots and lots of them. Uh, just take take a single sample if that's the case. Uh, if not, take some photos, uh, document where you're at, and uh, again, they're probably always 
just about always rare. There's a few of them that aren't, but for the most part, they are. So uh, yeah, just just let somebody know where where they're at. You can uh, send me information, or you can send it on down to uh, uh, Fish and Game um, to the to their uh, Natural Heritage Program, and they'd be glad to take that information and work with you on that. Uh, slides for identification purposes in the field. It printed. Uh, I. Uh, Someone's asking about whether I, I'd share the slides and I would, my, my concern is uh, not sharing them. My concern is whether there would be copyright issues. So I don't know if I've even already violated that, but whatever. So we, we'd have to look at that, but certainly we could take a look at that and uh, we could put together some sort of local guide that way. I think that's uh, kind of all the questions I see now. Um, I'm going to just add one more thing to the chat. If you, if anyone has any um, suggestions about locations for a field trip, um, just e email me there, programs at nativeplantsociety.org, and we'll uh, we'll get that organized. Um, it's going to be it'd be great to learn more about ferns. And so let's see, we've got 42 people still with us. And what we should do is just, if I can figure out exactly where it is, have 